We have been sent a case to evaluate a site number 14. The message is, could you review this plan? I think my buckle margin may be out a little too buckle. More importantly, I have to do a sinus bump of 4 to 5 millimeters and want to use a 6 millimeter legacy from Implant Direct. Also, how would you plan the surgical guide? Would you plan the implant to the end of the sinus floor, which would be the depth of the osteotomy to do the bump, or the ideal placement with the implant into the sinus and then gauge the depth of your osteotomy? Thanks for all the valuable info at the 3D Drive. <clears throat> First, I, I want to thank uh, those that who did attend the 3D Drive. I thought that was a fantastic event um, with a lot of wonderful knowledge shared and uh, fantastic energy. Uh, if you weren't able to make the 3D Drive, do plan on doing them in the future. They are absolutely wonderful events. So uh, uh, a small commercial there. <laughs> so let's take a look at this. Um, we have uh, site number 14. We have CEREC data. We also did a bite plate. So many may ask, why do you do CEREC data and a bite plate? Um, uh, typically, if you do a bite plate, it usually means the CEREC data won't go into there. So let's go ahead and hide this. And the reason that a bite plate was done, and probably rightfully so here, is there's full coverage restorations there, 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 all the way in the front. So we really do have a lot of scatter here. We may be able to depend on 6 and 11 to integrate, and possibly the teeth with the larger amalgams would be able to use for integration. So uh, I believe that this is the right thing to do. Uh, go ahead and take the bite plate scan just in case it doesn't integrate. So that way you're not having to scan the patient a second time. Uh, so good, good job there. Um, but th the good news is the CEREC data did integrate. Uh, but I do want to reflect on one aspect of the CEREC data integration. Uh, one, one of the pet peeves of mine is uh, doing a proper drawing of the CEREC data. So if we were to draw our margins, we would want our margins to be about right here. So I see that way too often is that these buccal margins and lingual margins of the teeth are drawn incorrectly. They're drawn way too far to the buccal because typically when we are doing our, our um, excuse me, when we're doing our margination, we're typically doing it from this view right here, uh, which leads us to just draw a circle. And if there's a a, <clears throat> a buckle dip here, like we see here, then it's very easy for the computer to drop that margin quite a bit buckle. And the same with the lingual. Although this one isn't too bad on the lingual. Uh, definitely too high on the buckle. And, and that can play a role in the planning, uh, the size of your tooth, and many different things. Uh, the other thing I also like to see, which was done well here, is I like to see the central grooves lined up in, um, in, in here. So that looks good. So let's go ahead and go to our plan area. <clears throat> and my initial assessment here is that uh, the, definitely this implant is probably a little bit too buckle. But when we look at it here in the occlusal table view, we can see that it's centered on a restoration. And we see that our restoration is not designed too big. It's actually designed quite well, minus the buckle margin. But um, so what would we do here? Well, what I would do in this particular case is I would go ahead and move the implant over to the middle, which will now move that to the lingual. And then I would just tilt the implant a little bit from the head and a little bit from the apex to get that back into alignment. And there we go. So now we have a more ideal placement of the implant in terms of coming in the bone with buccal bone and lingual bone there. Now, to answer the second part of the question, I would plan the implant to ideal depth. I would, I, I believe in a fully guided system where we allow the implant, allow the guide to drive the implant into place and to maintain the trajectory and to maintain the depth. So, um, you know, that, that's my personal preference. And what I'm going to do here is just hide some of this data. Um, and now here we can see what I would do here is now measure the distance from there 
to there. Actually, what? let me do it a different way. What I would actually measure is we know this is a six millimeter implant. So I want to drill to about right here, go to the bottom of my implant. So that's about a three millimeter line, as we can see right there. So your osteotomy needs to be three millimeters short of your normal length. And that's how you know that you'll be just below the base of the sinus, below that cortical plate. Then you can take your osteotome and lift this up uh, and then go ahead and add the bone into the site. So here, this particular uh, dentist has planned this for a 5.2 by 6 millimeter implant. Um, and uh, some of the literature is showing that these short implants certainly do work. Um, you know, if you don't want to lift as much, we could certainly put the implant right here. We have very thick tissue right here, as you can see. So we can have a little bit of that implant sticking out just a hair there on the palatal, but we still have it color covered completely on the buckle. And, um, uh, and now we probably only have to drill maybe four millimeters of the six millimeter implant and then lift the sinus about three millimeters, uh, three to four millimeters, which I think is uh, very possible in this particular case done with care and, and good technique. So hopefully this makes sense. And I want to thank everybody. Uh, thank for sending in, in this case.